Hello and welcome to another Science Book Club where I use my wit and charm to trick other scientists into recommending science and science fiction books with me. With me today is Fiona from a PhD student at the Australian National University. Fiona works on positrons in our galaxy. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so I'm interested in understanding where a lot of these positrons in our galaxy are coming from. So positrons are a type of antimatter, which means that when they meet ordinary matter, they do this thing called annihilation. And this is quite cool because what we can do is we can actually see the annihilation taking place by the gamma rays that are produced in the process. So I'm interested in studying the gamma rays and also where the positrons have come from. Okay, so you use gamma ray telescopes to look at the sky yeah. and say, right, that's where the positrons are annihilating. Yes. And what does that tell you? Well, it tells you something about obviously where the positrons are annihilating and you also find out a little bit about uh, the kind of conditions, sort of how warm everything is where the positrons are annihilating. That, that's quite interesting to us. Um, and we think because the positrons don't stray very far from their sources, they're kind of confined by these magnetic fields in space, that the annihilation sites trace the production sites. So they correspond to one another. So you can work out where all this antimatter is coming exactly, from. Exactly, yes. Right, okay. Uh, so Fiona and I previously did a video on how to survive your PhD. I'll put a link in the description. Fiona's nearly finished her PhD. I finished mine. Go check it out. We've got some useful advice in there <laughs> for prospective and current PhD students. So the books we've got this week, I've got The World Set Free by H.G. Wells. And what's Fiona brought? I've brought The Inferno, which has no dust cover on. Um, so it's only got the, the title along the side. And this is actually written by an astronomer and his son, but it's a non sorry, it is a fiction book. Yeah. yeah. So we should probably introduce the author was Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle was an astronomer, cosmologist, very, very famous one. He came up with the phrase the Big Bang. Uh, he was trying to be derisive. He didn't like the Big Bang theory. Yeah. I mean I don't like that show either, but <laughs> <laughs> Fred Hoyle was a steady state cosmologist, meaning the universe had been around forever. He was against the idea of the Big Bang, he, and he was derisively saying and astronomers seem to think that the universe began in this Big Bang, and since then we've stuck with that name. He was a brilliant astrophysicist though, and also a very, very good author. So last week I had time to read this book, and I think it's a really good book too. Yeah. So why do you recommend it? Um, I, I think I recommend it as a, as a science fiction book because it really is a book which captures what it is to do science in a fictionalized world. Because often you'll read a book, say you read um, Angels and Demons by Dan Brown, and this is a book where antimatter features in the plot. And the scientists, as they're depicted in the book, don't behave the way real scientists would. Whereas this is written by a scientist, and therefore you get very accurate characterization of how people actually behave in a research setting, especially the interplay between particle physicists and astronomers. Yeah, I, I found that really accurate too. So we've got a CERN particle physicist, we've got optical astronomers, radio astronomers, yeah. both of whom we've worked with. Yes. It, Fred Hoyle was an astronomer and the science, the way the scientists work is portrayed very accurately and very amusingly. Uh, you've tagged a quote in <laughs> I there. Have, yes, this is possibly my favorite quote in any book, any science fiction book um, ever. Um, so if you, so this book I should point out is actually really hard to get a hold of in print form because it went out of print years ago. Mm. Um, it is really easy to get on your Kindle though. So you can actually just download it um, digitally um, don't try and go out and find a print copy because it's really hard to find. But um, in my edition, this is on page 66, I really love it. Um, and it said, um, there's a character called, called Armand, Dr. Armand. Armand had gone away into the darkness. I'll just bet they'll stop for a snack, thought Cameron, perpetually eating these damned astronomers. Which is very, very accurate. And um, if you're doing a nighttime observing run, you will find that you will just eat constantly. And it's just such an accurate observation. I liked, I'm damned if I'm going to act as a nursemaid, especially for astronomers. <laughs> Why especially? They're a quarrelsome lot, notoriously. I'm not getting involved with their kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very accurate, sort of the, the interaction, especially between the particle physicist Cameron and all of the different astronomers he meets, because you know he kind of has this idea that they're all a little bit quirky and unusual. Um, and but it's know, accurate. It's very, very accurate, yes. The, the obsession with observing. I've seen yeah. that a bit. Uh, I, you may have seen that with astronomers you've worked with, but they're, 
you do seem to find astronomers, some of whom really work to understand the phenomena in the sky they're seeing, and some who just observe and don't look deeper beyond the observations. They're just obsessed with observations. And you've got both those kinds of astronomers in the book. Yeah. So as people who work with astronomers, we find it amusingly accurate. Yeah, so there's like there's the stamp collecting astronomers who just like to say, oh, well, I've catalogued all of these things. And then there's the ones who are kind of like, oh, well, maybe we should try and interpret this observation. Um, and often the two don't always quite see eye to eye. So when did you read that book first? So it's, it's a funny story. So because um, this is kind of it's about our galaxy and one of the things that I'm interested in is is what is going on at the center of our galaxy um, and, and without spoiling the plot too much um, I'd kind of been talking about our understanding of how the center of our galaxy works on Twitter um, and uh, an astronomer who works at the University of Sydney Grant Lewis had seen my tweet and he'd said oh you know you should take a look at this book by Fred Hoyle it's called the Inferno and my parents follow me on Twitter as well, and they're probably maybe watching this right now. So hi, mom and dad. Um, so they follow me on Twitter, and, and what my mom had actually gone and done is she'd searched all over the internet for this copy of the Inferno, um, which was very, very hard to get, as I mentioned, and she gave it to me for Christmas a couple of years ago. So that was actually how I came to first read the book and how it was suggested to me. Okay, so it was a relatively recent find, not something you read as yeah, a kid? Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. It, was, it was something I definitely have only just read for the first time in the last couple of years. So I think it's a very well-written book. It's certainly very entertaining, even yeah. for even beyond the... It has pictures as well. astronomy and science knowledge. Pictures. It does actually have a picture. Does yours not have a picture no, in Kimble it? No, the Kindle version didn't have a picture. So oh, it, oh, okay, yes, sorry, yes. This actually has, um, as well, which I think is really cool, is it's one of those science fiction books which errs on the side of what some people call hard science, which just means that the physics in it is very, very real. Mm. And this actually has pictures which show how some of the physics that's described in the book actually works. And it's got a full calculation here. If you oh. think The Martian by Andy Weir was hard science fiction, <laughs> including sort of working out of various things, this is even harder. Yeah. You, he works out how things are going on in the galaxy and yeah. that was interesting to see but I did sometimes think I, I want to read a book I don't want to sit through a lecture yeah. but yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very good book so when, what was your when you first read it what was your impression about how exciting it was a, as a book why why is it the one you've decided to recommend today probably because it's the one which is most kind of close to my research in particle uh, astrophysics so it was kind of cool to read something which was about something um, it's about a phenomenon that um, some astronomers actually predict has happened in the past in our galaxy. Um, so that was what I thought was very, very cool about it, um, was it was about a topic which is a very big topic of debate, whether this could happen, um, whether the events in the book would actually happen in reality are probably very unlikely. Um, but the physics which goes on is, is very close to what I work on personally. Um, and also, I just love the character dynamics. It's one of those actually very character-driven books. Mm. And I love books where the characters, you really get a feel for who they are. Mm. And also, because a lot of the book is set in places where I, I visited a lot of the places in the book when I was growing up. So every place in the book is based on a real place. Right. So Scotland, all of the descriptions of Scotland are pretty much all describing real physical places and they're places which, you know, once you've walked along those paths and you know what that place is like, to see it described in the book just makes it really rich. Uh, so that was very, very cool for Okay, me. for me it was just describing parts of Scotland. So <laughs> there's Inverness and things. And yeah. I don't know where any of these places are. Yeah, so it's probably different kind of if you've been to those those kind of places. So when was that book published? Um, That's a good question, actually. Um, do, 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 do. It was published in 1973. Ah, uh, okay. Because yeah. I was thinking some of you may need a warning in that the treatment of women in this book is more along the lines of Sean Connery-level James Bond. Yeah, it's um, mm. it's very, I think, of its time. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the one flaw with the book is obviously it was published in 1973 and, you know, around that time there are lots of very prominent female scientists but the ratio of men to women in astronomy wasn't as close to being somewhere getting towards equality as it is, as it is now. Um, so yeah, there are no sort of female scientist characters and I think the two female characters which do feature in the book are not really treated um, in a way which I think would be appropriate 
today. But what you've got to remember is it is of its time. Mm. Yeah. That aside, very good book. Yes. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I only read it last week. <laughs> so in sort of another scientists save the world, mm -hmm. they save the world eventually. Right. Scientists sort of destroy the world. The world set free by H.G. Wells. So H.G. Wells is the, one of those famous canonical science fiction writers. He's up there with Jules Verne as the mm. original brilliant science fiction writers. I think my favourite H.G. Wells book would be War of the Worlds. I'd, I suggest you read that one too. It was really, really good. It's I better than the movies. I need to read that because I've only ever seen the movie with Tom Cruise. Uh, so I do need to read that book. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I don't think this one is quite as good a read, but as a scientist and as a physicist, I find this one fascinating. So H.G. Wells is the guy who came up with the phrase atomic bomb. Really? It, in this book, he invents the phrase atomic bomb because this oh. was written, this was published around 1910. So Rutherford and Soddy, the scientists, had just discovered the amount of energy in radioactive atoms. But radioactive atoms release, when they're just decaying, release that energy very, very slowly. And so the idea was, can we work out how to release this energy more quickly, make it do useful work? And Rutherford said no, basically, but others were more optimistic. And also, if you could get it released really quickly, you could make the mother of all bombs. H.G. Wells was up on all that physics, and he imagined that you could make an atomic bomb. Oh, and wow. there's the famous phrase in here, and these atomic bombs were strange even to the men who made them. So it's interesting, to, it, it's fascinating the way he imagined things playing out. So this was published in 1910, just before World War I, and basically everyone at the time could see World War I coming. The clouds of war were on the horizon, everyone was convinced a war was only a few years away. So what he does is he delays World War I until the mid-1950s because mm -hmm. that way he gives the scientists in the book enough time to work out how to get nuclear energy and make nuclear bombs. So for that reason he delays the war to the middle of the century, so more like World War II. Mm -hmm. So the war plays out more like World War II because you have flying machines and submarines and things like that. But by that stage more of the world's countries have nuclear weapons and they use them against each other and so the world is devastated in a nuclear war. Wow. But also the way he portrays the weapon is interesting so because the rate of energy output from radioactive material is so slow he thought uh, he, he said right let's take this and make it many many times faster but he made it with the power of a conventional explosive so a conventional bomb but one that kept on exploding so oh, it okay. would explode for weeks but with right. the power of a conventional explosive. So it's more like you drop one of these bombs and it creates a volcano in the middle of your city. Oh. But still creates radioactive fallout, right. devastates the city, and uh, just destroys huge areas. So the plot starts off with how the discovery of nuclear energy goes about, how it changes the world, and then descends into war and how this war is fought. Mm. And it's very very good it's very well written it's surprisingly believable uh, as long as you ignore that he didn't know what kind of nuclear reactions mm. would occur so basically nuclear reactors shovel out gold as a byproduct and so that destroys the world economy oh, so. if only that was the way it uh, was you know yeah so you turn bismuth into gold and that's how you get nuclear energy okay. in this book right so it's kind of a combination of this quite old-fashioned alchemy idea of turning something that is relatively worthless into something of a huge amount of value but also this it's quite prophetic in a way where it's sort of saying this is the kind of devastation that mm. could come from you know this scientific discovery how this can be twisted into a weapon yeah so the book up until sort of the end of the war I think is amazingly prophetic and it's amazing how accurate he gets that the, the real bomb was built in 1944 he builds it around the end of the 1940s oh, yeah. and has the war in the middle of the century. It's yeah. amazingly prophetic. The, it's after the war that I think it stops being so prophetic and right. gets a bit weird <laughs> or less, less believable because the war shocks the world into being sensible, <laughs> which, I, which I think is the most unbelievable part. Yeah. So 
the remain the surviving nation leaders at the end of the war club together and they start running the world along more sensible lines we think the world's been shocked into being mm -hmm. sensible and they say right we need to rebuild re-establish we need to house refugees we need to re-establish farms and teaching it's hilarious in the way they deal with america in this <laughs> Ooh. Because the, all the national leaders sit down together and the American leader says, right, first thing we need to do is write a constitution. And the rest of the world says, no, first thing we need to do is find shelter and food and medicine for the millions of refugees. Oh, okay, well, that's a good idea. Then we'll write a constitution. Yes, America, then we'll write a constitution. <laughs> a few months later, right, we've housed and sheltered and fed all the refugees. Now we write a constitution. No, we're living on supplies of food that were farmed before the war. We need to re-establish farming, we need to re-establish medical production, and things like that. Okay, right, then we'll write a constitution. Yes, America, then we'll write a constitution. Mm. Give it a couple of years. Right, so now do we write a constitution? No, we still need to establish schools and <laughs> hospitals and supply lines. There's still a lot of work to be done. Someone will uh, just give America his damn constitution. Pretty much. So then the book jumps to like 30 years later. Still no constitution written, but the world is working in a socialist utopia where scientists and teachers are on top. So scientists and teachers are at the top of the social food chain, uh, along with farmers, right. because they've still got nuclear energy. So energy is cheap and plentiful. You can basically do anything. People are paid in energy. Basically, everyone has an energy allotment that they can use to not exactly barter, but food requires mm -hmm. a certain amount of energy to produce. So out of your allotment of energy mm -hmm. for the year, you get food and you get a house and things like that. You do what you want with your allotment yeah. of energy. But the farmers, the farmers are sort of at the top because you need farmers to sustain a society. Yeah. And then there's the scientists and the lawyers. And because, oh, sorry, lawyers. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> I'm thinking about our society, I think. The scientists and teachers are at yeah. the top. And basically, if you're not a scientist or teacher, you're further down yeah. the social food chain. And because there's so much free energy mm. and there's plentiful food, plentiful resources, basically anyone who's not a scientist or teacher can just live in a life of luxury okay. and just uh, live a life of leisure, do whatever they want. So it's an interesting end to the book, but I think that's the least believable part, but it's fascinating and hilarious from a scientist's point of view. It's interesting that yours sort of ends, or it has this idea of the whole devastation of the whole world, and then this coming together of, of kind of in this sort of socialist idea where everyone works together to pool resources which are not owned by the individual. Because actually this book is very, very similar. So it's actually, towards the end, you start seeing this society form, but it's not on a global scale. Mm. It's on a very, very highly localized scale but the kind of like the same ideas are there yeah. I mean the same idea of we have to in, work together in one there. of the regions anyway so yeah, what yeah. one regional leader says right we have to pool all our resources yeah. for the good of everyone in some ways I think this is a lot more realistic in mm. saying what a, a post-apocalyptic world might actually look like at least on the smaller scales um, and I, but I think that this is wonderful because I mean this is the sort of writing that gives me hope for, for our world, I think. H.G. Wells is very much a guy who thought scientists should be running the place and yeah. I see, I'm not entirely, you know, if you read the description of some of the astronomers in this book though, I'm not entirely convinced that no. that's a wholly good idea. No. We've got a big statue of Winston Churchill down the road, I think. Yeah. He was very convinced about the, poss the potential of science and technology to make the world a better place, but that Scientists need humanity as well yes. in order for it to be effective. Yes. Well, Fiona, thank you very much oh, for joining thank me. Thank you much, very much for having me. Well, we'll see Been you good. next time. <laughs>